Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Vijay Sairam, and I will be the moderator for today's webcast on the craft of API product management. We have a very exciting session lined up. As always, uh, you will find links to the references made during this webcast on the resource console of your screen. If you have any questions, feel free to post them at any time in the QA console, and we will ensure the fact that we try and address most of them time permitting in during the Q&A session. With that said, in the last few webcasts, we spoke about the increasing importance of APIs in the enterprise digital landscape and why many companies are now treating APIs as products and not one-off projects. We heard from the likes of Walgreens, Telstra, uh, on how managing APIs as products has helped them completely transform their business by creating innovative experiences for their customers. Today, we will take this a step further and learn about the craft of API product management. This four-part series will aim to capture how bringing a PM approach, a product management approach, helps you and your organization deliver on your vision of treating APIs as products. With that said, I would like to welcome our speakers for today's session, Bala Kashi Vishwanathan, uh, Head of Product Management Google Cloud, Apogee. Welcome, Bala. Bala is super passionate about helping enterprises become digitally, uh, digital faster with APIs. He's all about powering an API-first world. I would also like to invite Greg Brossman, Product Manager, Google Cloud G Suite Marketplace. Greg uh, is all about the art of product management. He lives and breathes the art of product management. Prior to Google, he was with Sil Silver Spring Networks, where he was responsible for the launch of their big data platform for utilities. Uh, the IO, uh, IoT cloud platform and applications. So welcome to both our speakers. Without further ado, as we get into the agenda, I would like to call upon Bala to uh, kick off the presentation. Hey, thanks so much, Vijay. Glad to be here. Very exciting topic. As PMs, I think this is going to be a fun topic for us to kind of uh, share what we know and what we can learn from our customers. So roughly, we're thinking of going through in this order where we kind of talk about the four Ds of product management, and specifically what that means for uh, execution. Then we'll also share some of the nuggets that Greg and I have learned over a period of time at Google and what Google PMs do really well. And maybe our customers can take some actionable items from there. And then, of course, we will then get into very specifics around what does product managing an API really mean. I'm guessing that most of our audience today is going to be kind of curious on that aspect as well. And then we uh, kind of talk about some of the things that we're going to follow up from this webcast into the next series of webcasts we're going to plan. And like Vijay said, we always will welcome questions. We want to keep this as interactive as possible, as much we can address. Let's get into the product management itself. I've been a product manager for quite some time now, and uh, so has Greg. I always think of this as two sides of the same coin, where I think people absolutely associate this role to be a mini CEO role sometimes, and I call it like the, the mini CEO role without actually the authority. But at the same time, you know, people think of this as a problem solving role. They think of this as a product strategy or a strategist role. And, and of course, being in technology, a lot of the product managers also tend to think like technologists and are kind of credited with a lot of vision and thinking around where we want to take the product and so on and so forth. In my experience, one of the things that comes across or jumps out for me is more about the product manager's role as somebody who brings an idea to fruition. Uh, more importantly, I joke saying that if you're really in for credit in a particular job, PM job is probably not the best job because you really are successful when you bring along a lot of people and make the product successful. So you, your impact and your success is ultimately dependent on the product itself. And if the product doesn't succeed in all humility, the product manager needs to take the accountability for being the person who is accountable for that product success or failure. Having said that, when people ask me what exactly does a product manager have to do, the one thing the product manager has to do, and my answer uh, specifically in that case is solve customer problems brilliantly, and the reason you want to do that is to build the product right, but more importantly, also think about building the right product. So that's what I think about in terms of saying solving customer problems brilliantly to build the product right and to build the right product. So how do, how do I think about product management in terms of a framework? I have come across, uh, at least in my own mind, uh, kind of four Ds to the product management as a framework. 
And I've tried to practice this and share this with a lot of my fellow PMs as a way to kind of think about product management. And, and the way I think about this is effectively the four Ds of dreaming, driving, delivering, and delighting. And in that sense, what it, what it really starts with is a dream. And the reason I say it's a dream is a lot of the PM's job is to kind of imagine a world of possibilities, imagine the art of possible, imagine how you can make things better for your customers or how you can solve the problems in a way which is almost like unreachable to begin with. And that imagination requires a little bit of dreaming. And once you do that, I think you set a, a very good context for everybody to rally around kind of that picture of where you want to go. Then it, I, th I think boils down to also, okay, what do you do next? And how do you think about specifically driving this element of product management? And here you're really driving a lot of specifics on how you think about data, insights, driving decisions, and so on and so forth. And then it becomes more about delivering, because as you think about driving these things, you've got to have a deliverable. And sometimes we think about deliverable as, as what we call as a minimum viable product, or sometimes we also call this as a minimum lovable product, because you need to get the traction with your users or customers in actually starting or beginning the journey and loving your product. It's an early version and really iterating on that particular early version to get to the point where the product actually has legs and is starting to grow and so on and so forth. Then it comes to about delighting the customer. At the end of the day, if you want a long-term relationship with your customer and the user, it is really about making sure that they stay delighted in the product. And this means taking care of the small irritants and taking them out of the way as much as solving some big problems uh, as part of your roadmap and continuing to delight the customer and not just have the first experience as delightful and after that figuring it out completely. So that's how uh, at least I've thought about framework what product management is, which is the four Ds, dream, drive, deliver, and delight. So with that, I want to kind of hand it off to Greg to give you a little bit more of his perspective on how he also thinks about product management, Greg? Right? Thank you, Bala. Uh, it's awesome reconnecting with the Apogee team. I've been a, a long time user and fan from a previous life, so it's a treat for me to connect with them uh, on the other side and work with them internally. So Bala's kind of laid out, it's kind of a lovely pitch for product management. It's about vision, dreaming, thinking big, delighting customers. What does this actually mean in a day-to-day -day sense? What are the kind of nuts and bolts of actually working in product management? I've tried to bucket the kind of individual tasks of a product manager into kind of three major categories as you think about the life cycle of a product, starting with the very beginning, which is kind of conceiving of a product idea. And no surprise coming from Googlers like us, users are at the center of this journey, and we'll stress that throughout. But really understanding what are your users, what are your customers trying to achieve, um, what motivates them. And there's a couple uh, kind of levels of that. One is what are their goals? So, so how, how do they define success for their companies, for their products? What are their pain points in reaching those goals, both at the industry level? So what industry are they playing in at the, at the company level? What's standing between them and success? And then finally, at their individual roles. And so we frequently tie all of our kind of product thinking back to really making sure we understand this customer journey. Once you've got a firm foundation for thinking about customers and users, pain points and goals, the next challenge is thinking about, right, where does a product idea fit into this? How does it help your users? And where does it fit within the broader kind of marketplace of products that are out there? Again, the foundational element for this is thinking about the value you can deliver for users. What pain point are you solving? How are you helping them achieve their goals, grow their businesses? So really making sure that user value is foundational to all your product thinking. The second piece that I think about is making sure even if you've identified a number of opportunities where you think you can help users, why are you best placed to go do that? There are probably many opportunities to help users out there, but what do you, your team, your company bring that's special that will enable you to really have success helping your users? The third piece is, all right, so you've identified user goals, you think you have a, a product idea that fits your company's strengths, how do you actually make this a commercial reality? Do you intend to charge customers for this? Is this something that they would willingly pay for? Making sure that you understand how you want to charge customers. And finally, differentiation from alternatives in the market. This is kind of playing off your company strengths, but just thinking through when you introduce this product in the market, how will customers receive it? What will they compare it against? 
And then the final piece of this is, all right, so you understand users, the product you want to bring to market. How do you actually launch this thing? Depending on the product manager you ask, some will say product execution is potentially the most important thing a PM can do. And it's hard to debate that. No doubt that vision is one thing, but actually launching the product, making sure that it's successful in the marketplace, your users understand how to use it, is really fundamental to success. There's a couple of things that you know I think about for any kind of product management role. One is fundamentally scoping the needs for users and what this product needs to be able to do. This will kind of ties into the second point, which is empowering your colleagues around you to help build the product, whether that's in engineering or design, legal, sales, making sure they understand what is the vision for the product, what is it designed to do, uh, and enabling them to be successful in building this product out. Once you've brought this product to market, how do you actually know it's successful? From a very early stage, we often talk about defining success metrics. Think about what does it mean for your users to be successful? What does it mean for you and your product to be successful? Try and define those metrics early on. Instrument them even into your product as early on as possible. And then when you launch it, frequently look back as, as objectively as you can and analyze, are we hitting the metrics and the targets that we wanted to? And finally, the fourth piece is just constant user feedback. So our users, do they, do they understand how to use the product? Is it aligning with the, the kind of pain points and value propositions that you put out there? Um, so constantly engaging with your user community. And this is a theme that I think we, we, we talk a lot about at Google, certainly Bala and I, as we were talking about this kind of topic, users are at the center of a lot of what we do. So we wanted to kind of take that framework for general product management and think about what do we actually focus on in Google? What may be a little different from what we've seen product management at other companies or other roles? What are the things that really make uh, product managers at Google successful? So we laid out our trademarked six G nuggets. So the first thing we think a lot about is talking to users. I think this is just a fundamental thing. And there's an interesting spectrum to consider. You know, many PMs will start with the assumption that I am my user. I know exactly what I want. And in a lot of the ways, that's right. You should use your own products. There's no doubt about that. But don't assume that your level of expertise about the product or what you're trying to achieve is perfectly aligned with your user community. Sometimes you may be shocked when you actually start talking to a wide swath of your users, that they're actually very different from you, not just on, the, on what they're trying to achieve, but even in how they use your product, how they think about your product. There are numerous, numerous like tactical examples of users getting stuck in certain flows, and you're like, well, of course, that button's right there. Why didn't you see it? Um, what's so obvious to you may not be totally obvious to your users, and that's critical feedback for thinking about the success of your products. I know one thing from my own um, current role here, managing the, the G Suite marketplace, which is our kind of enterprise app store around G Suite, was really thinking about who our users are. I kind of come into the role assuming that it's developers who are the only ones touching our marketplace, but it turns out a lot of the times our users are actually on the marketing team. And it was only through doing this kind of extensive user research, talking to the user community as much as possible that I understood actually our main user for a lot of the tools we provide out there are product marketers, not developers. Rick, I think one of the other things I would love to add here is that at Google, one of the things we place a lot of emphasis on is to also be inclusive and think about diversity of users. And that also comes through when you talk to the real users here. And when I say diversity, it could mean are the assumptions we're making around the actual device the same across the world, for example, or the network bandwidth, you know, or the abilities of people as to what they can do with their phone or the laptop or the device which is connected to their TV or any of those things. I think that is another very important aspect is uh, I think one of the things I feel very proud and what we do uh, well and we keep trying to improve in Google is how do you build a product which is truly inclusive and takes care of all diverse needs from people all over the world with different abilities? Yeah, I love that, that example of uh, the kind of mobile connection. You may assume here in the U.S. that all users everywhere yeah. can access your apps at the same speed, but it's just not true in many countries. I think that's great. So I touched on this a little bit earlier, but leveraging your company's strengths, this is something we talk a lot about at Google. And, and you know, there's kind of a couple examples that come to mind for me around this shift from there's many opportunities, go do them all, but do them kind of half-baked, to really focusing down on a few opportunities and really differentiating yourself. No doubt at, at Google, kind of scale is critical to everything we do. We're, our, you know, we're at an incredible scale. There's a lot we can do at that kind of scale. Within Google Cloud, we talk a lot about AI and ML. So Google is really focused on the TensorFlow uh, product uh, as a way to really uh, leverage the existing expertise that Google has in those domains and open them, that up to, to, to customers. 
And then even within G Suite, you know, real-time collaboration is foundational for a lot of the products we focus on there. And so we try and make sure anytime we're thinking about new features, new products within G Suite, we really want to leverage that kind of DNA around real-time collaboration throughout data. So data is really critical. You know, Bala and I were talking about the role that data plays, and we were reminded of uh, this awesome quote that was out there. It's from um, Jim Barksdale. He said, if we have data, let's, let's look at data. And if all we have are opinions, we'll go with mine. <laughs> so data is the great like arbiter in debates you're having around product direction, features, impact. And so we try to remain as data-driven as possible. You know, if you get 10, uh, 10 product managers in your room, you'll have 11 opinions probably. But data is one way to cut through the noise and try and filter out what exactly is happening for your products in the markets and how are users really engaging with your products. Rely on your users. So it's not just one thing to frequently engage with them for feedback, but really you can actually lean on them to, to, to think about the next generation of features, the next generation of products um, that are out there. And, and the spectrum that you know, we think about here is product managers will do many different functions over the course of a day, their careers, but it's not necessary for them to be a superhero covering everything. They have an, an amazing array uh, of colleagues internally, but also in the broader, kind of broader product community around them. Um, so you can, be, you can and should talk to your customers as much as possible to, to understand what features do they want to see in the products. Um, they will have an amazing insights that you may not even think of. And, and so we frequently turn to this community for ideas. Uh, an example that comes to mind for me is, again, going back to the marketplace, um, we have a number of users, partners who have built businesses around this platform. So they naturally have a ton of ideas on ways to improve these business uh, these features and really ideas that will take their businesses to the next level using the marketplace. Next is kind of baking all these discussions, ideas, features into a broader vision. This is one of the most critical things, I think, both for product managers anywhere, but also particularly at Google. You know, we think about 10x ideas is what we like to talk about, which is don't necessarily focus exclusively on 10% improvements, although they may, they're, they're certainly necessary. Um, your customers will give you lots of ideas around ways to incrementally improve the, the product. But make sure you have an opinion around what's that transformational change uh, that, that's possible out there. And so develop this, this vision uh, in collaboration with your colleagues around you, the product community, your users, and make sure you evangelize it all the time. Um, there are many different channels to get this vision out there. And some companies, they prefer kind of in-person presentations. Sometimes it's written documents. Um, whatever channel it is, I think it's just really critical. Make sure you tie in all your proposals, ideas into a vision. And ideally, everyone on your product team around you deeply knows how their work ties back to that vision. So, yeah. Uh, and one thing here I think I want to emphasize, like you Greg said, is that it's important to have the vision and then work towards it. And that might mean a lot of steps to get there. As uh, somebody kind of quoted once that overnight success happens after a lot of years. So it does take a vision to be very true about, uh, true in the direction you're going, what problems you're solving. But like you pointed out, it might require multiple steps to get there. And having a vision brings all the people and inspires them to kind of work towards that vision, which is very, very critical. I think that's right. Um, when, I, when I think about vision as well, just to your point, it takes time. Um, and, and also, there's no shame in evolving a vision as well. As you learn more about the, the user community out there, as new technologies emerge, there are opportunities to, to, to evolve and refine that vision over time. Um, but having an opinion about it is critical. And, and I think the two examples, at least, that strike for me as good examples, at least from the Google context point of view, would be one, I think we embarked on a mission to uh, make browsing faster and safer. And I think it, it has not been overnight. I think, but today when we look back, I think the achievements we have in Chrome and how people are very happy to use Chrome today, I think it's a testament for what we've been able to achieve. Similarly, the other thing I think about is that when we started thinking about an open source you know, uh, uh, operating system for the mobile phones or smartphones, you know, it is unheard of, uh, but I think the team persisted and keeping that vision and creating an ecosystem and a community of both developers and manufacturers for handsets. And today we look at the worldwide adoption of Android as a mobile OS. It took somebody to have that kind of a vision from a product point of view to achieve that. So those would be some examples where I, I can think about how it takes a long, hard uh, effort to get there 
but that vision is what inspired a lot of people to kind of work on that project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, the final thing that we talk a lot about at Google for, for product managers um, is having the kind of, kind of courage to prioritize. You'll be amazed by how much feedback you get from your user community, how many ideas bubble up. Um, there's so much to do. Uh, and I think it's just a general rule. You will never have enough resources to do everything you want to. So it really does make mean making some very hard decisions about what you're going to go after. This may be, you know, this may be sound surprising that even Google has to make this kind of uh, <laughs> decision, um, but it's true. Every day as product managers here, um, we're thinking about where can we deliver the most impact. Uh, and sometimes that means saying no to certain things. Yeah. And, and we also, uh, like you rightly pointed out, even at Google scale, we have probably more interesting problem to solve, and hence we need to prioritize as well. It's not like we, we have resources to solve everything. Uh, but uh, the thing I really like about how we function in terms of PM and how we prioritize in Google is, again, goes back to your point of data, where you can learn something, look at the data, and at some point that data informs you as to whether you kind of proceed with the project more or shut it down, for example. Uh, and that's how you prioritize the, the resources you have. I also want to say, make sure that, like, I think the, the six G nuggets that Greg, you shared, are, I think, very applicable to a lot of our customers. But I think I also want to highlight to the customers that what they do need to think about is, in, in some sense, they, they have to think about what, how does that apply to, you know, kind of the, the mission that customers are kind of going after. In, in Google's context, it's all about organizing world's information and making it universally accessible. And so everything we do, I think it's attached to that mission. And I think for each of our customers who are listening, they have to figure out how to prioritize also in the context of attaching to whatever the mission they have. And I think what I find um, super interesting is that we've been able to not only attach to the mission we have, but we've also been able to have uh, a success uh, to prove it because we have like over seven products, uh, you know, which are, have a billion users each. And that proves that if you attach the right mission, you inspire with a vision and execute and prioritize, you can have success over a long period of time. And then coming closer to what we do at Apogee, I think it's very aligned to Google's mission, but also it's aligned to a, a mission where we believe that information can be made accessible via APIs and we want to connect the world through APIs. And that has been something we have been focused on a lot. And I think our proof point again is that we have hundreds of customers today that use our product for API management. And that's again a proof point. So I think each of our customers can do a similar kind of thinking on what their core mission is and what, how do they prioritize and then how do they measure success and ultimately like you know, Greg, the, the ultimate measure of success is having customers and continuing to have customers. So while we gave you, G, you know, the six G nuggets and, and we talked about mission, uh, the one important thing as PMs, I, I think we remind ourselves uh, within Google and within our teams is uh, to be you, to bring yourself, and this goes back to the inclusiveness and the diversity topic we talked about earlier and also have fun. And again, uh, you know, when I talk about fun, this is a good example of us poking fun at ourselves. So this is a, a you know, kind of somebody within the PM community at Google uh, decided to create a, a roadmap and uh, which we, we lovingly call every enterprise product roadmap ever. So you can talk, see how we actually not afraid to have fun and poke fun at ourselves uh, in that context. With that, I think let's switch to the section in terms of really uh, what does product managing an API really mean and uh, how we can kind of share what we do, uh, both Greg and myself, in terms of how we think about API and the product management of an API. Um, Greg, why don't you take it away? Awesome. So I'll try and tie back the kind of framework that we presented about product management at a high level, some of the best practices from Google, as Ball said, actually tie that a little bit more firmly uh, into the API world. So, so starting with no surprise, really we try and focus on what's the business problem we're solving uh, and, and who are we solving it for? It's kind of two elements there. Researching users is kind of where, where we always start. So understand who are the, the kind of clients for this API? What are the, still, what are they trying to achieve? Are we delivering value to them? Uh, and, and there's two additional elements that I kind of think about here, validating the idea as much as possible. So once you understand users, where their pain points may be, um, and the value you pose to provide to users, 
um, validate that as much as possible through as much research as possible. Talk to users, customers, um, others in the market, uh, and make sure that this is real. And just make sure you understand who who's getting value out of this. Um, oftentimes, obviously, whoever's building apps on the other side uh, of this API platform, um, they'll actually be, be delivering those apps to their own customers, to their own end users. When I think about the, the kind of API platforms that I've worked on in the past, um, I, I've seen kind of multiple groups of potential users out there, um, some from the enterprise community, so for example, who may need you know, easier access to, to data than they're currently able to get um, within their own enterprise, as well as third-party developers. And again, they, they could be building new apps um, on your platform, they could be integrating existing applications, but they'll have their own community of end users on the other side of their applications. Understanding your users. So, so again, the big revelation to me when I first started working on, on APIs is that there are real people actually developing on these. Bala and I have been joking the past couple of days that uh, the bots haven't taken over yet. Um, there are real people out there developing who have opinions, ideas, preferences. And one of the ways that this kind of manifests itself uh, is, you know, for me, working with standards that are out there. Um, one example from, you know, that I was dealing with a few years ago was um, what time standards to use when, when, when I'm reporting timestamps. There's, you know, a couple different opinions, you know, Unix time, um, there's other standards that are out there. Talking to users is a great way to get a sense of, do they have preferences? Is there whatever vertical you're working in, is there a standard already that you should work towards? If there's not a good standard, should you uh, propose something new? Um, so your users may have real insights and opinions around this. Uh, and, and a good example for this, specifically bringing it back to the API concept itself, uh, since we talk about API management, is some of the work that we've been trying to do uh, in partnership with other uh, vendors and companies in coming up uh, with a clear standard around open API specs and trying to see how that can become an industry-wide standard for how you describe APIs and design APIs. And I think this is something we'll touch a little bit more uh, in detail in the next uh, session of the series. But to your point, I think those things help a lot in understanding from the customer where the pain points are. And this open API spec is one way to solve a particular customer pain point, which is how do you standardize the description and, and, and the design for APIs across every enterprise customer? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Your developers will thank you uh, for adhering to standards that they're familiar with as much as possible. The third element I'll just touch on there is the kind of MVP, the minimum viable product. Um, obviously, this is a popular way to get a product to market and start collecting real feedback from real users out there. In the enterprise context, it can be a little bit more challenging in that you still want to collect as much feedback as possible, but there's a certain quality threshold that you need to adhere to, um, particularly when working with developers. If they're investing their time and resources in integrating their applications with your API suite, uh, it may not be acceptable to do the kind of level of iteration that you may otherwise want to do in other contexts. So I, again, I think this goes back to really understand who are your users. There may be some users who are more comfortable iterating with you early on uh, as you're refining your API suite. And this user feedback, no surprise, is at the center of you know, how we think about the, the kind of product life cycle. We've touched on a lot of these elements, um, conceiving the products, actually developing them, working with you know, your developers, UX, documentation, bringing the products to market, whether that's via MVP or some other model, continually improving uh, those products with, uh, with, that, with, with user feedback. And I think particularly for the API world, thinking about end of life, how do you actually uh, improve products, backward compatibility? Um, it's really important as you're thinking about APIs as products to make sure that they fit into uh, this kind of product lifecycle framework. And I think Bala will talk a little bit more uh, about that in more detail. Once you understand the kind of business case that you're, you're targeting, the use cases, uh, the users that are out there, the use cases is kind of the next element. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, generally these are applications um, that are being integrated with your API suite but that are providing value to another set of users on the other side of those apps. Um, so understanding who are those users and what are the use cases that your API suite needs to, needs to meet. And there's a couple of things that come to mind from my own time uh, managing an API suite. The examples include data types. So is this raw data that you're delivering to applications or is it process data, um, aggregations, normalized data, or is it a mix of both? Usage patterns, uh, do the clients on the other side of your APIs, will they be giving you a fairly constant stream of requests or is it highly variable, in which case you need to architect um, your system to, to, to manage that? 
the reliability uh, of your API. So are these critical messages that are going through that there may only be one message and it's got to get to that client at the right time, or is this something where clients are able to make requests uh, later on for any drop messages? Uh, and finally, upgrades. I think in my own experience, this was something really critical to think about. Um, how do you manage downtimes? How do you manage upgrades? Um, how do you think about backward compatibility for, for your developer partners um, on the other side? Uh, and then finally, a business model. So, you know, it's one thing to understand the business problem, but how do you actually transform that uh, into, a, a, into an actual business model? When Val and I were, were chatting about this, uh, obviously one, one possibility is to monetize it, but really there are, there are multiple ways to think about driving value from the API suite you're bringing out there. One is naturally directly monetizing it, um, but the other is kind of strategic benefits. And I've seen kind of both models where you're trying to foster uh, an ecosystem uh, of apps uh, around your API suite. Either way, whatever kind of model you choose, I can't iterate enough how, how important it is to tie this back uh, to the value you're delivering. So make sure your, your, your users understand that value uh, and that your business model aligns with it. One interesting note here uh, is customer expectations. So particularly in the enterprise use case, you may be dealing with, um, with users who expect, let's say, a flat billing model, who don't want to see surprises in their bill from month to month. You may have other customers who want to directly tie their billing to usage. Um, and so again, this is really understanding who are the users that are developing applications on the other side of your API suite. And you may need to be flexible, particularly early on when you think about uh, the business model uh, you want to, uh, want to move towards. I couldn't agree more with you, Greg, which is like really start with the business problem, understand the users, understand the use cases, and then figure out how to monetize, what do you want to monetize, if you want to monetize. I think that was a key takeaway from you. I, I wanted to actually uh, switch gears and talk about APIs uh, and how you product manage, product manage APIs, but more almost like a practitioner here. Uh, and one example I would give is that even for the API, I think the PM needs to think about being the first user. And I think that's critical. Uh, in our case at Apogee, what we do is we li literally have our own management APIs, which is what I, we use to build our UI. And the reason we do that is it's a great way to make sure that A, these are actually useful, B, they work as advertised, and more importantly, understand you know, the pain point customers will go through if they're trying to build something using the same APIs. So to abstract it up one level, I would say be the first user, uh, both as a PM and your own engineering team, if you're building something uh, for the API. And if you build on your own APIs, I think you will understand the pain, what a customer would go through over a period of time, and that will set you in the right path. The second thing I would also ask to uh, kind of take away is that empower the customers, right? So one of the beauties of having APIs is it allows for the customers to be empowered to extend the product, customize the product, and do interesting things with the product. And you, you almost can learn from that. And we have seen the same thing happen with Apogee, is that when people use our APIs, they are able to plug and play into a, a existing automation they've already built, or CI, CD pipelines they use. Or sometimes they even take data out of our system and use that for some other purposes. And all these are possibilities, and at some point, as you know, Greg, one of the challenges we're going to have, uh, and each one of our customers who's listening in as a, as a PM, is that you'll never have enough resources to build every feature, but if you can unlock and empower the customers to use the API, for the subset of customers who want something very, very important to them, and which is not applicable to lots of customers, you've given them a way to kind of enjoy that feature and without you having to spend the time. So I think there is an aspect of empowering customers there, which is very, very useful when it comes to, if you think about APIs as a product feature and not as an afterthought. So it's part and parcel of the feature and you should think about the value proposition of the API as much as you think about the product itself. The third one, uh, which is probably near and dear to a lot of our customers if you, you are joining in, is I think just like the product life cycle, I think there's an API life cycle. And this is something we do talk to our customers a lot. In fact, we try to build our product around helping with this vision of API life cycle. And we constantly are pushing ourselves to make sure that we do a better job and we improve what we do for API life cycle for our customers. But effectively, it follows a very similar trajectory like which you pointed out, Greg, in your product life cycle, which is you've got to build an API and there's a set of things involved in this. 
then you understand how it's being used, understand the data, understand the use cases, and then finally, you know, make sure that it's available and running efficiently and uh, reliably for our customers. And that's exactly what we try to promote in, in the product. But more importantly, that's what we promote in how customers should think about their own APIs in terms of an API lifecycle. Given that we covered three important pieces, one, uh, you know, why and what product management is all about, then we shared, I think, the Google best practices, or like we called it G Nuggets for uh, product management. And then we went into specifically what you should be thinking about when you're product managing an API. I think what I want to switch gears is to really talk about what, what's next. You know, what, what do you do now that you've gotten this information? Into going into what next, I think uh, the first question I would probably pose is, have you got a PM? Right? And the reason I ask this question is that when I interact with a lot of our customers, I think if you went through the previous slides, I think each one of you can associate with probably the things we described as something you do, but some of you may not actually have a title called product manager, and that's fine. But I think it's very important to understand that there is a person or there are, there are, there are folks in your team who specifically do the things we described, or Greg and I described as important things to do for an API. I think that's the starting point. When, when Greg and I think about you know, the attributes of PM, and from a Google point of view, uh, this is how we kind of think about it and frame it. For us, uh, for a PM, it is very important to understand the scope, and this means scope of product, scope of the organization they're trying to influence, and then, of course, you know, having uh, the technical scope, clarity, and insights. And this is very, very foundational to every PM being successful uh, at Google. And we think it's very translatable to pretty much any organization out there. That if you're a PM, if you don't have the clarity and scope of the product, organizational influence, and the technical insights you can bring, then I think you don't uh, have a, a good foundation to kind of be successful. The second thing would be to really have uh, the core skills of a PM. And then this boils down to having good product insight, having good design thinking, and collaboration with your design partners. Uh, and again, to Greg's point, having a very inspiring vision about what you want to really change in terms of change the world for your customers and how you want to do that. But then having very clear methodical ways to execute on that. And then like Greg pointed out, ability to communicate that using the channels appropriate for your customers or your organization. At the end of the day, I think uh, the part of the PM skill which is extremely useful and important is I think leadership. And this is almost like, I think, the, the term I've heard repeatedly is called servant leadership, where you are here to serve the customers, and you have to bring together all your constituents to serve the customers, and that's how you should think about it. Um, and as we've joked about before, uh, this is one of the PM roles is where people think themselves of CEO. It is a CEO without authority, so you get all the responsibility, but not the authority. And hence, the leadership part is the critical part. How do you lead? How do you serve your customers and how do you influence people? And if you do the, that scope and the skills correctly, then I think you have significant impact and it's visible uh, and it's measurable. And I think you automatically get uh, acknowledgement even without you having to kind of ask for it. And that's something we, we thrive here at Google. And I think this framework applies to any PM out there and how they think about it. Anything you want to add, Greg? No, I think that's that, that's exactly right. The scope is an interesting piece only insofar as you kind of think about the immediate scope that you're going to be focused on on the product side, but also where that fits into the, the broader scope that your product team, your product group, even the company is trying to address. And so, uh, you know, to Bala's point around the vision, making sure that that vision and that scope just ties into that broader kind of company strategy. Uh, and finally, on the impact side, this I think ties really clearly into the metrics. So making sure you're using data, you're defining what is secure, what does success look like, uh, and constantly measuring that. So, so the next, I, I guess, step, one of the questions you might ask is that, do we grow or hire? So the one thing Greg and I can vouch for is hiring for PM talent right now is probably the hardest because of what we just described in terms of the scope, the skills required, and how critical it is to success of any product. As much as you should try and hire great PMs and who can manage your APIs, I think there is absolutely nothing wrong in growing the talent within your companies. And we do this all the time, even in Google. Uh, you know, we have people 
Um, in fact, we have a formal PM rotation program where we allow for PMs from other disciplines to kind of be a PM and learn the craft of PM and then over a period of time become formally a PM. And sometimes these are actually uh, on some of our best engineers. Uh, this is sometimes our, our best kind of customer facing, you know, technical uh, folks. Sometimes it's somebody who's in a, a much more of a technical program management role. So we kind of welcome and give the opportunity within Google to actually cultivate this talent and actually help them uh, be successful and then kind of bring them into the fold of PM. Um, I think we have a formalized path for that. Uh, whether you have a formalized path or not, I think I would really encourage each one of you to take this as a best practice and think about how can you grow the talent within your company for folks to become PMs and use the, use the community outside your company, use the community of PMs within your community to create an environment where people can actually come, learn, grow, and then become PMs. Uh, we believe that having strong, skilled PMs that can only benefit you and your company, but also benefit the world at large because as PMs, one thing we all know is when we see a bad product. So uh, uh, the world would be a much better place if we had great PMs, right? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just echo that, particularly on the point around there are multiple channels where we see PMs come from. And I think particularly at Google, we've been formalizing that process to identify, to attract, um, to onboard PMs for, from multiple kind of backgrounds. And I think that that's Something that I've seen more broadly, even outside of Google, and I think that's something to consider potentially um, in your own kind of organizations, is thinking broadly around where do people who are passionate about products, who love connecting with customers, who can generate vision, where might they be? And it may not be in the traditional places that you may think they reside. So I think be very flexible, be open to candidates from a, a variety of places within your uh, domain. Yeah. And so, so you might be asking, okay, how do I proceed with that? Um, so here's one thing we're going to do in the upcoming three other uh, sessions in the series. We're really going to start kind of sharing a framework for you. We're calling this an API PM matrix. And really what we want to do is help you and your teams understand what kind of PM skills do you need uh, based on the program, API program maturity you may be having, which is really about, you know, who you're serving, and how do you want to serve that customer audience better? We will be unveiling this matrix with specifics around what skills uh, apply to what, what API program maturity uh, over the next three-part series uh, following this one. So I hope that each one of you can kind of join that session or those sessions and kind of learn more on how we can actually take what we talked about today and really operationalize it and also have a framework of understanding where you are today and you know where you may want to go tomorrow in this matrix and what does that mean for you as a team, for you as a PM, or for you as an API program. So uh, before we get into some Q&A, uh, I kind of want to um, make sure that we, we do talk about the fact that we do have a product that actually helps product managers around APIs. Yeah, I'll be remiss if I didn't talk about the API management product itself called Apogee Edge. So if you are interested, please do sign up and try that. And then we also have some resources for you. Vijay, do you want to kind of uh, talk about this? Absolutely, Bala. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Bala. That was uh, very insightful. Yes, uh, the vision of APIs products, we have a microsite for you where you can go on to read strategies, to, you know, testimonial, customer success stories of organizations that have followed the same path that you are planning to embark on. Uh, we also have previous webinars that you can consume. Uh, the links to those uh, resources are available uh, in the console. So Bala, this is uh, this is a very interesting question to the both of you. And um, I would like this, uh, the, this question has come from Brian. Please explain what you feel is the primary difference between a technical architect role versus a PM role. And I think that's very apt given the conversation that we just currently had. Yeah, I, I think the way at least I would frame it is that uh, we work with a lot of really strong, uh, great technical architects, and we are almost spoiled here at Google for having those kind of uh, skill sets. The way I think about it is this, the technical architect is, if I go back to my first slide on what do we PMs do very well, we as PMs need to solve customer problems brilliantly, and we are more here to build the right product, whereas the technical art architects in my mind are here to help us build the product right. That's the difference I would say. So it's a partnership, but I think the technical architects keep us honest by building the product right 
and PMs have the responsibility of building the right product. No, I, yeah, I love that framework. You know, in my own personal experience, uh, I've worked closely with technical architects before. Some of the, the kind of requirements that I, that I highlighted around when you think about APIs, reliability, what the clients actually need out of uh, your API suite, that's a place where a technical architect is going to have really critical insights and help the PM shape those product requirements. Um, I think where the, the PM is going to be kind of uniquely focused is, again, choosing the right set of use cases to, to, to pursue, as well as the, the commercial model. So just thinking from a business side, not only what should the product do, but you know, what is the, the value exchange? Do we choose to, to monetize this product or not? So I, I do think it is a very close partnership between the two roles, though. Uh, you know, we're having a lot of questions, but I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to take still one other, one more question. Okay. Um, and this is primarily, though it's a little more about the product, but I think it makes a lot of sense because it's talking about trade-offs and value, uh, messaging the value within the organization. So the question primarily from uh, Govind is, a lot of companies believe in portal to serve customers, API portals, opening APIs does not generate huge enthusiasm is a question mark he's asking. How do you convey the value and the concerns, if any, about cannibalizing distraction? So, so I think for me, this boils down to, uh, I think there is a phase where part of Apogee early days, I think everybody wanted to create an open API and a platform. Uh, and they believe that if you build it, they will come. But I think it goes back to the fundamental things that Greg highlighted, which is that what is the business problem you're trying to solve? Who are your users? Mm -hmm. What are the use cases? And is there a monetization aspect available or a commercial model available or not, right? So if you apply that to this question, I would almost start with those questions first. Why? Right? The, the portal is there to serve customers, but what exactly is the problem you're trying to solve? Is it about educating your customers about APIs, which they can use to customize and extend the product? Or a, APIs as a way to integrate and plug into your ecosystem? or build applications to create revenue streams, or what is the business problem you're trying to solve? And then it really boils down to who's the customer. And in this case, I think automatically you take care of the, the cannibalization or any of the other distraction challenges is that if you're very clear with the customer and how the commercial model has evolved, then I think you have a very clear story to tell internally and externally as to what you're doing. Right. Anything to add? No, I think it's a it's a great question. You know, I've certainly struggled with this previously as well. One of the things that you know I've really you know seen is kind of tied back to that prioritization idea where we're never going to be able to do everything we want to. Um, and so one of the things that having uh, a robust API suite enables us to do is to really empower users, customers, and the ecosystem around us to fill in that suite of features. Uh, and products that you know we're not able to directly provide today. So I think that in addition to a portal, having additional apps that are out there in the ecosystem really end up enabling you to deliver uh, additional value to your customers and users. And that's what I've always tied it back to, is ultimately our, our, our users, our customers will be more successful if we've got the right API suite in place. Um, and, and so that's what my pitch has frequently been. Uh, thanks, Greg. Thanks, Bala. We're completely out of time, but we are not done with this topic. Uh, there's a part two. As I mentioned, this is a four-part series. There's a part two on October 11th, which is launching learning and the API PM discipline. You know, we'll use this. Uh, we're going to use that session to talk a lot about organizations or API providers that have launched API first products. Uh, how do they measure success? Uh, you know, how do they establish a product management team? So we're really looking forward to a very interesting next session. So I encourage everybody who's on the webinar to kindly register for the upcoming series. With that said, we're completely out of time. We really thank you uh, for your time today. Um, and uh, you know, until the next time, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.